Centre for Generational Kinetics, a global research and speaking firm that delivers original research which separates generational myth from truth for leaders around the world. Their team has helped leaders reposition global brands to win each generation and taken clients from last to first in both employee retention and customer growth. Considered an authority on Gen Z and millennials, as well as the number one generation speaker and researcher, Jason delivers research-based insight and specific practical solutions for leaders to drive tangible results. Jason wrote his first best-selling book at the age of 18 and has been featured on over 200 television shows, including 60 Minutes and The Today Show. Please welcome Jason Dorsey. Woo! Thank you. This is going to be a very different kind of presentation. I need your help. How many of you on a daily basis interact with people of different ages? Would you raise your hand? Let's do this all over there. Wait, raise your hand, there you go. And how many of you have had a conversation with someone of a different age? It was very, very, very important at the end of that conversation, you knew when they walked away, they had no idea what you just told them. Raise your hand. Exactly. So what do a bunch of you in here do? I know what a lot of you in here do. You take out that pen you have and you write us a note. In cursive. <laughs> we can't read cursive. So we send you a text with only emojis. And somehow, you as a leader have to make this work every day. Am I right? You're living this with your families. Am I right? Some of you in here, you have called your kid five times. Ring, 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 ring. No answer. You send a text. Boom. Right? And you're paying for the phone. Yet so much of what is said about generations, particularly my generation, the millennials, just isn't true. Where's my millennials in here? Raise your hand, let's prove it right now. Hold your hands up, millennials. Look at this, all over the world we got millennials here. Why is that important? If you read the headlines, we should not be here. <laughs> we don't show up to work apparently, we're gonna come to a leadership program? Yeah, we're here, aren't we, millennials? Where's my people? That's what I, and we're dressed appropriately. Our pants aren't falling off. Right? We paid good money to be here by Venmo. We did it. So maybe, just maybe, some of what is said about generations, every generation, isn't true. In the time we have today, I'm going to share with you what is true. I'm on an absolute mission all over the world to separate myth from truth, to share with you the strengths of every generation because we all bring so much value. Now this, I promise, will be different than what you've heard elsewhere. So I will ask you today, for those of you that have your notebook handy or your pen or whatever it is, to take notes on a few things, which I know is a little bit unorthodox here, but it's really important to me because I promise this will help you with your family, your friends, your community, and it's gonna be different than you've heard. So let's start with this. The number one trend that shapes generations, which nobody talks about, and everybody gets uncomfortable, but we have to get uncomfortable sometimes. The number one trend that shapes generations, please write this down, parenting. Ooh, I went there right off the bat. And my millennials, my people, our parents are what generation? Baby boomers, that's right. And baby boomers have a distinct parenting philosophy that has absolutely come back to haunt them. <laughs> Where's all my boomers? All over the world. Raise your hand, boomers. Hold Woo! Boomers, boomers. Well, keep your hands up, boomers. Hold them up. Let me look here. Wow, that is a lot of watches. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> wow, I always wondered who bought those. <laughs> <Ta -da! laughs> 
All of you boomers who just raised your hands, promise me, please promise me, you will never retire. <laughs> Ever. We need you so badly. You have all kinds of skills my generation doesn't have. My favorite, long division. I mean, it's incredible. It's like magic with a pencil. <laughs> I mean, you actually own pencils. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> I mean, you know there's a lot of boomers here because you showed up with your own notebook. <laughs> Holding up the notebook. That's what I'm talking about. I told you we we're going to get real today. So why is parenting important? Because parenting influences everything we do. Let me give you some examples. We're influenced by our parents. Is a job beneath us? Ooh. Should you go into debt to go to college? Should you go to college? What's acceptable risk? What's unacceptable risk? One of the biggest complaints about my people, the millennials, is people say that we're entitled. And I just, we're gonna go straight there right off the bat. We're gonna get uncomfortable in here, it's okay. We know from a fact at our research center that entitlement is primarily a learned behavior. Oh, <laughs> all the boomers thought this was gonna help you out. Oh no, you complain about us, you created us. <laughs> Starts with parenting, reinforced in schools, becomes acceptable within the generation, and then we show up to work and we're like, hey, it's been a month. Where's my promotion? I was here almost every day. <laughs> so parenting is this huge through line that we study. And I'll share with you more about our studies. But just notice, when we look at generations, they're clues and not a box. They're driven by trends that we can study. And we study them all around the world. The second trend, write this down. I won't ask you to write much. Write this down because you're seeing this. The second trend we study, technology. What we uncovered at our research center, listen closely, is every generation has a natural relationship with technology that is largely driven by our age. But it's invisible until we are forced to interact with someone of a different generation. And I'll prove it right now, and it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> Who in here remembers a computer that took punch cards. Raise your hand. Oh, there we go. There we, who has no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> who in here, who in here remembers when the remote control came out? Come on, right there, remote control. There we go. Who in here was the remote control? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And I wanna go even further. Who in here remembers using a ditto machine or a mimeograph? Raise your hand. Oh yeah, and what'd you do with those? You cranked it, right? You cranked it, and when the paper came off, what'd you do with the paper? You smelled it. <laughs> the purple paper. Look at all the young people, look, look, look. They're, they're all like, why is that dude smelling the paper? <laughs> Email doesn't smell. And I wanna go even further just to hit it home. Here's my iPhone right here. When I woke up this morning, I called my daughter, which I do every single day, no matter where in the world I'm speaking, Singapore, Paris, you name it, India, doesn't matter. I call my daughter from this iPhone. My daughter is eight years old. Her name is Raya, remember that, R-Y-A. She's named after my great grandmother, Raya. When my daughter turned two, we found out that was not my great-grandmother's name. <laughs> Thank you, Ancestry.com. <laughs> so when I called my daughter this morning, eight years old, going into third grade, how did I call her from this iPhone, parents and grandparents? FaceTime, right? Now look up here, look. So I'm talking with her. She's talking with me, 
We have this whole conversation going on. My daughter, eight years old, will never remember a time before you could look at the person on the phone while you were talking to them. In her belief system, that is how the phone works. Let me say it differently. If she can't see you, she won't talk to you. <laughs> She'll say the phone's broken, put it down, and walk away. <laughs> what was the cartoon where you could see the person you were talking to? It was about the future. Come on, Gen X. The Jetsons, yes, listen closely. My daughter will think the Jetsons is about the past. <laughs> because what we discovered at our research center, it's called the Center for Generational Kinetics, is that technology, listen closely, technology is only new if you remember it the way it was before. It's one of our most famous discoveries. Otherwise, it's all you've ever known. If you've come of age right now, you're a kid, you think you will have always been able to talk to Siri or Alexa. There's a generation right now that thinks broadband is slow. Yet many of you remember sending pictures by dial-up. Remember that? Like pi pixel by pixel it's downloading. And there's several other factors that we study at our research center. One I just want to share with you because it's not talked about enough, and that is geography. What we uncovered at our research center is within the same generation, you will see differences based on geography, and nobody brings that up. You'll see differences between urban and rural, and differences as you travel around the world. The most consistent generation in the world today is Generation Z, the youngest generation, 23 and under. Why? Cheap is the key. Cheap mobile technology. When I speak in India, Sweden, doesn't matter. When we're talking about Gen Z or even millennials, very consistent. When you go up to Gen X or boomers, dramatically different around the world. In the US, for example, we'll see differences between urban and rural. I grew up in a small town. Where's my small town people? There's gotta be some here. Small town people, let me hear you. There you go. Who in here has ever walked into the grocery store and had a spontaneous family reunion? <laughs> right, that's how I grew up. My best friend's from New York City. His high school graduating class had students from 40 countries. I'm from Brenham, Texas. My high school class, there we go, look at that. Like, the whole town's here apparently. My high school class in Brenham had people from two countries, people from Texas and everybody else. <laughs> so the key is this. I want to share with you a little bit about our research center. What we're called, if you'll look up here, is the Center for Generational Kinetics. And what we do, and our focus, is separating myth from truth about generations. Why do we get into this? Because I would speak to corporate executives and boards and leaders in communities, and they would say all these negative things about generations. And I didn't know any better, so I said, can I see your data? So they gave me their data, and it almost never matched what they just told me. So we decided that the way to solve this and bridge generations was to do primary research around the world to separate myth from truth, to figure it out. Because somebody's got to be the source material that's accurate, that has no agenda. I have nothing to sell you other than myth versus truth. That's it. We do quantitative research, qualitative research, behavioral design. Bottom line is we've done more than 60 studies in the U.S. and around the world. We have 10 studies going right now on three continents. So what I'm going to share with you today is the why behind the behaviors everybody else tracks. Because we're behavioral researchers. And it's going to be fun. <laughs> so if you would... You can see up here a little bit about our clients. We have 150 clients. Great, you're impressed. Let's go to the next one. Okay, we do research. Perfect. So here's what I want to do. I want to right now start to demyth generations with you. Take out your pen if you brought a pen. If you do not have a pen in your little packet, no problem. Turn to the baby boomer closest to you. <laughs> Ask to borrow one of theirs. 
They brought two. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. You got an emergency pen and an emergency check. I mean, you even carry cash. <laughs> wow. So we're going to separate myth from truth, and what we're going to do is we're going to cover every single generation that we can in the time we have. Now, if you will, look at the birth years. There's a lot of controversy about birth years, and that's because a lot of people talk about generations who, to be candid, we're all friends here around the world, are not researchers. For us, generations start and stop based on something called predictability by scenario. When do people stop behaving in the same way rather than, oh, we have nice round years? For millennials, for example, we start somewhere between 1977 and 1981. Do we know exactly where? No. Why? Because there was no defining event. It was a transition. When we broke the news that millennials stop around 1995, 1996, why? Because if you're born after that time in the U.S. and North America, you do not remember 9-11. Well, guess what? All the big research firms had to change their data because they all went to 2000 because it was a nice round number, but that doesn't matter if you're a researcher. If you don't remember the event, it didn't change you. So for millennials, what do we need to know? I'm gonna give it to you right now. My millennials, listen closely. It's the first time someone's ever gonna talk positively about us. <laughs> so let's just hit the high notes first. What do we need to know about millennials? Number one, millennials are now the largest generation in the workforce. Everybody says we're unemployed, yet more of us are working than anyone else. <laughs> now, there is some truth about one of the things we research, and that is millennials are experiencing something called delayed adulthood. <laughs> it's totally true. We seeing the, on average, all these major commitments be pushed back. My brother's a great example. When my brother was 30 years old, he was married. He married our next door neighbor, literally. <laughs> literally, he searched far and wide. <laughs> That's funny if you're from a small town. Everybody else is like, what? When my brother was 30 years old, he's married, two beautiful daughters, two SUVs, great job. Like, he made it, he did it. When he was 30 years old, my mom was still paying his car insurance. That's ridiculous, right? And it's not like I could say something, because then she'd take back her gas card. <laughs> you can get a full meal at the gas station now. I mean, come on. <laughs> what does this mean for you as a leader? It means if your millennial employees or colleagues are hitting all these gateway markers later, entering the workforce, finishing their education, buying their first home, getting married, whatever, any of these things, having their first child, it changes how they look about stability, benefits, work-life balance. All of these things begin to shift, and we need to be aware as leaders to make sure we're adapting and not looking at the 25 or 30-year-old through the lens of a 25 or 30-year-old 20 or 30 years ago. Do you know that the demographics that say 18 to 34, coveted by advertisers, that came out of the 1960s. So often we don't adapt as leaders, yet we need to if we're going to be effective. Our biggest discovery with millennials and our most controversial is we discovered the millennial generation is splitting in two. In fact, it's in this room right now. What we uncovered is one part of the generation is doing everything we were told we were supposed to do. He told us to go to school. We went to school. He told us to get a job. We got a job. He told us to be here. We're here. We showed up. We didn't get a ribbon or a trophy for showing up today, did we, millennials? <laughs> right? I didn't even get a name tag. Nothing. <laughs> but we're here. We're taking notes. We're developing ourselves. We're doing everything we're supposed to. Here's the deal. Nobody wants to talk about us. We're not controversial. We're not provocative. We're not clickbait on social media. We show up. We do what we're supposed to, and we go home. And then you have another part of the generation that's struggling to create real-world traction. Watch here. This is wild. So what we uncovered is as the generation splits, it breaks apart, we call it a dislocation, as it splits, for some reason around the age of 30, you self-select 
into one part of the generation or the other, and you can no longer relate to the other part of your own generation. Am I right, millennials in here? In fact, the group most offended by millennials acting entitled at work, other millennials <laughs> who do not feel entitled. We think the rest of the generation is giving us a bad reputation. And then what happens? Our boss tells us to mentor them. <laughs> we don't want to mentor them, they're terrible, okay? You hired them, you mentor them. <laughs> so if you would, take a look at this slide. It's the most controversial thing I'm gonna share. What we see is this one group we call these megalennials, and then we have this other group down here called me We've always had late bloomers. Everybody take a picture of this. This is for you to take back. Talk about this at a meal conversation. I promise you, it's a hot topic. We're seeing this play out everywhere. Organizations, politics, leadership, you name it, engagement, on and on and on. Now, we've always had late bloomers. That's true Gen X. That's true with baby boomers. It's even true with traditionalists. The difference is a late bloomer used to be 25 years old. Am I right? Now we're seeing those behaviors at 35 and older. So as we start to look at this generation, let me give you one more thing, and I think it's key. Before I give it to you, just listen closely, leaders. I want you to think about how this affects your communication. Please finish this sentence for me. Millennials, we are tech savvy. Thank you. Please don't write that down because it's wrong. But everybody thinks it's true because we're constantly staring at what? Our phones, exactly. We're texting, we're tweeting, we're walking into walls, yes? <laughs> but what we uncovered at our research center, and this is so important for communication and engagement, listen to this. Millennials, we are not tech savvy. What we actually are, we are tech dependent. And it changes everything we do. You wanna engage us in your religious organization, your company, family member, community, it's completely different if you're tech dependent versus tech savvy. Now we're gonna pause there and we're gonna switch and talk about Gen X because frankly, nobody talks about Gen X. <laughs> Where's my Gen Xers? Raise your hand, Jenna. <laughs> Woo, look at this, Gen X is here. I love this, I love this, Gen X. You are amazing, you survived the 80s. I mean, Gen X is incredible. So what do we need to know about Gen X? Millennials in here, listen closely. We will be working with Gen X forever. <laughs> They're never leaving. As a leader, what do you need to know about Gen X that's not talked about? Gen X is at a very interesting life stage where they're now starting to take care of their parents, and who else are they taking care of? Often their kids, they're being pulled in two directions. Gen X tells us right now, do they stay at their current employer, or do they go somewhere else? At the same time, Gen X is naturally skeptical. Gen X is the only group that will come up to, after me, to me right after this event, and they'll say, Jason, I really enjoyed your presentation. I didn't think I would. I'd love to see your data. <laughs> no one else has to see my data but Gen X. Millennials come up and they're like, hey Jay, you got anything on video? And boomers come up and they're like, Jason, do you have a handout I could take back? <laughs> love to use it for training purposes. <laughs> There's lots of reasons behind all this. We don't have time to go into all of them, but just notice, Gen X is at an interesting life stage. They bring this skepticism, and we believe that Gen X, you are the glue in the organization. Because Gen X, you don't like millennials or baby boomers. <laughs> Am I right? And what I've learned is no matter how much I talk about Gen X, I normally speak for three hours or a whole day all over the world. And what I found is no matter how much I talk about Gen X, they still feel 
like I didn't talk about them enough. <laughs> Which is why we're moving on. <laughs> to my boomers, where's my boomers again? Raise your hand, boomers. Boomers, woo! Check this out, everybody. Check this out, check this out, check this out, check this out. Baby boomers are amazing. They know geography. <laughs> Is that not incredible? They can read a map that doesn't talk. <laughs> They're geniuses. I go to check in at a hotel, they give me a paper map. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> How do you know where North is? <laughs> It's funny because it's true. <laughs> what do we need to know about boomers? Two quick things. Number one, baby boomers define work ethic. They measure work ethic in hours per week. Oh. And though now those hours don't count unless they can see you. <laughs> if they can't see you, you're not working. And boomers also believe there are no shortcuts to success. You must pay your dues. They believe in policies, procedures, protocol. You must use a fax cover sheet. <laughs> what is a fax? You know, on the contact page of my website, it literally has an email icon, and it's like click to email, and a phone icon, and click to call, and it has a fax icon, and next to it it says, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and let's quick do a sneak peek of Gen Z. I have a book coming out next year on Gen Z. So excited, this generation, they're gonna change the world. So what do we need to know about Gen Z? There we go. There you go, Gen Z in the house. So here's what we need to know about Gen Z. Number one, Gen Z, their parents are primarily Gen X or older millennials who raise their kids very differently. In fact, when we interview the parents, what do they tell us? We told our kids, you will not end up like those entitled millennials. <laughs> Gen Z also came of age around the Great Recession. Now, there's people running around saying, Gen Z struggled in the workforce through the Great Recession. They were 12, okay? No, but they saw who struggle? Their parents. And what our research uncovered is that Gen Z is very practical with their money. They're driving thrift store sales. They have a birthday, they get money, they take the money, they put it away, and they go back and ask you for money to buy something. In fact, we predict that there's a really good chance that many members of Gen Z are going to leapfrog some of the millennials. And it's gonna be really interesting over the next five to 10 years. So what can you leave here and do? Let me give you a bunch of things to leave with. As a leader, I know you wanna leave with specific actions. Let me give you some right now that work. Here we go, we're gonna go fast. Number one, if you were to stop me and say, Jason, what's the one thing I can do whether or not I lead a big team, a small team, my religious organization, company, doesn't matter. Here it is. The best thing you can do, provide specific examples of the performance that you expect. You want us to do something? Make it a video or a photo. Show us what it looks like. Why? Because the language of leadership varies in interpretation by generation, gender, and geography. You tell us, Jason, the dress code is business casual. Oh, so we show up with khakis and flip flops. <laughs> business casual. <laughs> Number two, and this is very important for the leaders in this room, and that's all of you, so listen, does it matter how big your organization is you lead? This is critical for messaging. What we uncovered is most leaders message in a linear format, steps one, two, three, four, five. Millennials and Gen Z do not think linear. They are completely outcome driven. They get a video game, they get all the cheats, they skip to the end, they beat the game but then they go back and play the game from the beginning. 
They just wanted to see the end first. Show us the end first. Work backwards one time. We will follow every single step. And then the third one. You have to, and there's not many things I say have to about. You have to provide quick hit feedback. More frequent feedback. Not trophies, not rewards. Keep all those. We got plenty of them. <laughs> I'm going to share with you what I mean. Hey, Sarah. I saw how you helped Jesse yesterday. Thanks so much for stepping up when we needed you. That's it. Stop talking. <laughs> Why does this not happen? Because other generations were taught, if your boss is talking to you, you're doing something wrong. My generation and Gen Z was taught, if your boss is not talking to you, you're doing something wrong. Now, you can use it by text. You can do it any way you want. Just do not leave us a voicemail. Please. <laughs> Ugh. My dad will leave me a five-minute voicemail. It's like a podcast. <laughs> Always starts the same way. Son, this is your father speaking. Leaving you a verbal text message. <laughs> that hit a little too close to home, I could tell. A lot of squirming. So let me share with you this last thought why I'm here. They don't even know this at the summit, the people that brought me in. But I'm going to share it. I believe that every single generation on earth, there's five in this room right now and five watching around the world, Every single generation brings something important. And every generation can lead. Am I right? Yes. And I believe that we need more leaders. Do you agree with me? Yes. I know for me, a leader just like you changed my life. I don't share my story very often, but I'll just share with you a little bit. When I turned 18 and decided to go into this route of speaking and writing books, I was basically cut off from my family. I turned 19 years old, sleeping on the floor of a garage apartment, $50,000 in debt. I lived off free samples at the grocery store for a year. And a leader, just like you, helped me. They didn't have to, they just did. And it changed the course of my life. And just like every one of you in here, you've helped somebody, and you will help many more. And one thing I've learned is so often we don't get the chance to say thank you. So I wanted to be here to say on behalf of me and my wife, Denise, and my daughter, Raya, thank you so much for all of the lives that you have changed. We appreciate you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you.